Brothers and sisters in Christ, happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Thank you. I'm glad that God has allowed you and I to be available on this Sabbath at New Life SDA Church, Nairobi. Today we are talking about Christian sacrifice. Christian sacrifice. And um, in the book of Psalm, this is the book of Psalm, chapter 50. And we will see what it means by Christian sacrifice. What is sacrifice? Let us pray. Precious Lord, thank you for the gift of life and for this wonderful Sabbath. Thank you for your sons and daughters who are here and those who are elsewhere. May your Holy Spirit speak to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. According to Macmillan English Dictionary for Advanced Learners, sacrifice is explained as to give up something important or valuable so that you or other people can do or have something else. Two, to kill a person or animal is part of a ceremony to honor a god or spirit. Christian sacrifice is done within Christian principles. Hidden sacrifice is done within hidden domain. Christian sacrifice is a person who has accepted Christ and is doing what he ought not to do. Yet he does it because he wants to do it for the benefit of someone else. You know, friends, Psalm chapter 41 verse 1 says, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. That's Psalm chapter 14 verse 1. Those who do not worship God are known as fools. Those who hate God are fools. Those who have educa education without God are fools. Wealth without God, those are fools. Property without God, those are fools. A family without God, that is also a family of fools. Original sacrifice is found in the book of Genesis chapter 3, where God himself spoke to Adam and Eve. Soon after Adamic sin in Eden, God looked at the sinful man with pity and saw a couple of fools who had decided to leave him and to shift their allegiance to the devil. And actually, uh, what you should know historically is that devil worship began in the Garden of Eden. The moment man left God and, uh, and decided to have some different allegiance from God to the devil, he became a devil worshiper. So when God looked at man and he saw someone who, whom he had made in his own image with his own love and he had given his own, his own likeness with the traits of his own, when he looked at this man having fallen from grace, having fallen from his image, he had pity on him. And having pity on this devil worshiper, God decided to bring back his own likeness back to human being. That's why God gave a promise in the book of Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. There's a difference between one who strikes your head and the one who strikes your heel. The difference is, if someone strikes your heel, at least you can limp and move to some 
hospital, you can get some first aid, and someone can help you. But if someone strikes your head, it might be fatal, and it might cost your life. So the worst kind of punishment is the one is that is that person who gets who gets that, 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 that kind of that kind of blow on the head. So when God was giving curses to the serpent, he said that the seed with capital S in your Bible, the seed of the woman will strike your head. Which means that God had already had already promised his own sacrifice, whom he was going to send, his own son, Jesus Christ, who was going to come down to bring back God's image that was lost in the Garden of Eden. Friends, it is interesting that when you look at John, John also, a disciple of Jesus Christ, when he was writing, God made him testify when he was actually, actually, in the book of John, there's a testimony about Jesus. And what is happening is that there was John the Baptist who was baptizing. And while he was baptizing, he looked up yonder and saw Jesus Christ. And then he directed the minds of his disciples and those who were by the riverside that behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. This was the promise that God had given in the Garden of Eden. This was the sacrifice that God had made before time so that when man would live on this planet in this full, sinful nature, then we would have some kind of hope in his own son, the Lamb. When we look at life, uh, the life of Abraham, God called Abraham and God told him to offer his own son, Isaac. When God called Abraham and asked him to offer his son, Isaac, Abraham did not argue with God. He did not argue with God because of the love that he had understood God had for him. Abraham had believed in God, and therefore, he trusted in God. When God asked for his son, he never argued, he never grumbled, he never murmured. He just moved on to sacrifice his own son. Abraham was a wealthy man, and because he had God in him, he was a wealthy man who knew the meaning of sacrifice. He no longer wanted to continue in idolatry of his ancestors. Abraham did not want to continue in the traditions of the Chaldeans where he had come from. For that reason, he, did, he decided to follow God and do the will of God. That's why Abraham was ready to sacrifice his own son. You know, uh, when you look at Genesis chapter 22, uh, at the kind of uh, the, the time when Abraham was going to sacrifice his son, Along the way, his son asked him, Daddy, here we have, we have, uh, we have uh, wood, and we also have coal. That is the matchbox. But we don't, I don't see any lamb here. And then his dad told him, Son, I want you to know that our God will provide. And Abraham moved on with his son all the way to the mountaintop, and just like Abraham had mentioned to the son, by faith, God provided a lamb. And that's why that place, and actually we are told that it was known as Jireh, Jehovah Jireh, God will provide, or God the provider. Abraham himself, the Bible says that he believed in God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. That's the book of, that's the book of uh, James. That's the book of James. Now, in James, we are told, James chapter 2, verse 20, you foolish man, which means a heathen, you heathens, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? That's NIV. 
New International Version. Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? That was the question. You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And it continues by saying in verse 23, James chapter 2, 23. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. Adventist man of God, Amo man and Amo family. It is important for you and I to understand that Abraham did not get that label from nowhere. But God claimed that Abraham is my friend. And Abraham got that brand, he got that name, that Abraham a friend of God. Why? Because he was obedient to God. Because he trusted in God's provisions. Because he knew that even if he were to kill his own son, the God who gave him that son was able to give him a replacement for Isaac. That's why Abraham was known as a friend of God. Why? Because he was ready to sacrifice. You, a man and a woman of God in this congregation, you should know that the moment you accept God and believe in him implicitly without wavering, you will become a friend of God. And your belief and trust in God will make you his friend. And when you become a friend of God, God will do wonders in your life. It is at this time of life and in society where we have so many things going through our lives. Different families have got different problems. And none is exactly the same as the other. We have come to church, but some of us are struggling. Struggling in life, struggling in our families, struggling with our sons and daughters, struggling with our, uh, with our neighbors, struggling with our workmates, struggling with our schoolmates, struggling even with some of our church members. This is what Paul was talking about. You might be struggling, but you must know that a life of a Christian, a life of an Adventist man, an Adventist woman, is a life of sacrifice. You cannot become a Christian without sacrifice. That's why Paul, uh, Paul, Paul talks about it in the book of Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to him, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to these world, but be transformed by renewing of your mind that you may know what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The life of a Christian is a life of sacrifice. Dear friends, here we are in the middle of many chaotic situations. Just from, we're just from Corona, which is not yet ended. And we have businesses that failed. We have families where people divorced. We have others who experienced deaths, bereaved families in different locations. These are the things that we are struggling through. And even coming to church sometimes has become a problem. The government brings restrictions. The Ministry of Health, Health has some protocols that we must follow. These are problems. Sometimes they squeeze us in some corner where we cannot worship God wholeheartedly. But the most important thing you must know is that God has allowed you an opportunity to know that for you to be a Christian, an active Christian, a living Christian, you have to live a life of sacrifice. That's the same thing. That's the same thing we see in the life, in the lives of many people, especially Paul. You know, Paul knew the kind of struggles that he had in his life. Some of us were baptized, 
and uh, in the course of time, you backslidden. Some of us were very good church members, very good officers in different positions of responsibilities, but for some reason, the kind of faith that you had the first time you got baptized has waned. It has diminished. It has gone do down. And, and sometimes you find yourself in a fix where your spiritual declension is at its lowest ebb. But this is what I want you to know, friends of God, that even Paul himself, in his Christianity, he realized that sometimes he wakes up in the morning and wants to do the right thing. But he finds himself doing the wrong thing. That's the book of Romans chapter 7. You see, I wake up in the morning, I plan to do well, I, I plan to do good, I plan to please others. But for some reason, I find myself in the middle of the daytime, I get into clashes. I meet some conflicts in life. We have conflicts in the families, conflicts in at school, conflicts in the church, conflicts in different places. These are the things that Paul also saw. And he cried out that I wake up in the morning, I want to do good, but I find myself doing the wrong thing. And then deep inside of him, he was grieving, crying in Romans 7, 24. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Dear Adventist man and woman of God, we are living on this planet, walking every day in different in different avenues, meeting various problems with variety of pain. This is what Paul experienced, and this is what you might be experiencing. You want to be a committed Christian in church. You want to be a committed Adventist man, a committed Adventist family, a, 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 a committed Adventist church member. But you realize that the things you want to do don't go well with you. The same thing which made Paul cry. And then he goes on to thank God for Jesus Christ. That the Jesus Christ is the one whom God sacrificed and offered him for your sake and my sake for your salvation. Hallelujah. Dear friends, even... A friend of mine by the name Dr. Barry Black, when he was addressing, he was a baccalaureate speaker uh, to the class of 1985 at Oakwood College, when he was addressing students, uh, especially the graduating class, he said that you see the problem with our youth is that our youth want things and they want them right now. I want a new car and I want it now, right now. I want a new apartment and I want it right now. I want a might I was well hard. I want a girlfriend and I want her right now. I want a family and I want a family right now. I want a new phone, I want it right now. I want a new laptop, I want it right now. That's the problem of our youth, not knowing that daddy and mommy spent many years of struggle to get some of these things. This is what we experience in life. Parents are here and you can, you can attest to that. We have our kids at home and some of them have come to church they have different demands and we as their parents want to satisfy their needs but not all the time will they be able to get what they want because sometimes they want an apartment right now but you cannot afford that apartment for him huh? they want a new car you cannot afford it right now that's why we tell them to study hard for their future lives so that they can afford to own some of those things, those apartments, those new cars, those laptops, those, uh, those expensive phones. Friends, life is not easy. Life requires sacrifice. You, as a, as a, as a parent, you want the best for your sons and daughters. You want them to enjoy life while they are under your care. And these are the children that we also want to become future leaders who will be responsible. We must show them where we can learn that when they come to church, when they identify with the God whom you worship, when they identify with the God of your family, 
when they identify with the God of New Life SDA Church, then God will be able to give them the success that they need in life. Life of sacrifice is what God has called us to. You have not come into a bed of roses, but this requires sacrifice. When, uh, when Jesus Christ was with his disciples during his last moments on earth, he was struggling in prayer with his disciples. And he left them for some time to go and pray on his own. When he came back and found disciples were tired and all of them were asleep. And then he had to ask them questions. See, the Bible tells us in Matthew 26, Verse 40 and 41. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Hmm? And then the question. You could not even keep watch with me for one hour? Watch. This is what Jesus said. Watch and pray that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing but the body is weak. That's where you are. There are several things that you have met in life. You've encountered different difficulties in life, different, uh, different ups and downs in life, and uh, you want to do that which is right, but you find yourself doing that which is wrong. Deep inside of you, the only thing you can do is to watch and pray. What you can do is to cry to God, ask him for help, to get hold of your hand, and to pull you out of those tempting situations. Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you could bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so you can stand up and uh, eat. This is the God we worship, friends. We are worshiping a God who loves us, a God who cares, God who provides an option, God who wants you on the better side of life. We know that when he sent his sacrifice, Jesus Christ, Jesus conquered. And therefore, if you join Jesus' team, you will be on the side of the winners. You will conquer along with him. This is what we have been called to as Christians. That you being a Christian, accept to sacrifice yourself. Accept to give your body to Christ. Accept to give your mind to Christ. Accept to give all your passions to Christ. That when Christ occupies you, when he becomes a resident guest, in your life, a permanent resident, guest in your life, then he will make you succeed. For boys and girls at school, our God will make you succeed in your studies. Those of you in businesses, God will make you successful in your business. Those with families, God will make you be successful with your families. As long as you identify with him, as long as you Give your body as a living sacrifice to him. Christ will take control of your life. And Christ will make you achieve what you should achieve. Christ will make you obtain what you must obtain. Christ will make you get what you must get for the glory of his name. Friends, each and every person of us has been called we have been called from different backgrounds, different families, different communities, different people. Some of us, if I use myself for example, my great-grandfather was, uh, was a witch doctor. You see, those are the backgrounds that we've left behind. God has called you from different places. Others were rascals, others were thugs, others were thieves, others were killers. Others were, were, were doing all sorts of things, corrupt lifestyles. These are the places where God has called us from. 
And now that you have come to him, please, please, for heaven's sake, do not regret it. Please, please, for heaven's sake, do not go back to where you came from. Because our God cares. Our God wants the best for you and I. Our God wants us into his kingdom that we may live with him forever. That's why God is calling us into this life of sacrifice. Psalm chapter 50, verse 14 and 15. Psalm chapter 50, verse 14 and 15. Sacrifice, thanked offerings. This is in NIV, New International Version. Sacrifice, thanks offerings to God. Fulfill your vows to the Most High and call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you and you will honor me. This is the voice of God. God wants you to lead a life of sacrifice. And having accepted him into your life, he also wants you to give thanks to him. And how will you thank God? By presenting yourself as a sacrifice. Hallelujah. God wants each and every one of us to lead a life of sacrifice. Let our hearts be full of, gra of gratitude to God for all his blessings that he has bestowed upon us. He has given us physical aptitudes and he has also endowed us with the spiritual uh, blessings or rather spiritual endowments. These are the things that we should put into use for the glory of his name. And when we exercise godliness in our lives, we are not doing it to get saved, no. We are already saved. God had sent his own son way back 2,000 years back to save you and I. Therefore, all he wants is for you to serve him with a heart of gratitude, a heart of thankfulness that you may not engage in your past traditions. You don't engage in the background where you came from. You don't have to follow your grandfather's traditions or your grandmom's traditions. You, when you come to Christ, he will give you a new life. See what Paul is saying in Philippians chapter 3 verse 12. Philippians chapter 3 verse 12 and 13. Not that I have already obtained all these. That's New International Version. Not that I have already obtained all these or have already been made perfect. But I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I know, one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining for what is ahead of me. Hallelujah. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which Christ has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus wants you to forget your past. Jesus wants you not to dwell in your weaknesses. But he wants you to come. He wants you to give yourself to him. He has promised to give us victory. Because he was a victor. He conquered. Now when you come and join his team, you are on the winning side. I normally give an illustration with some of these teams. Some of you here might be, might be fans of uh, Manchester United. Others might be fans of... Uh, of, 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 uh, let, let me use Gorma, Gorma here. Uh, if Manchester United comes here or Arsenal comes here to play with Gorma here, can you predict who will win? Can you obviously predict? Yes, you can predict that Gorma here or, 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 or uh, we call them stars around the stars you already know that Harambe Stars cannot beat Arsenal. They cannot beat Man, uh, Manchester United, Man U. Because you know their strength from history. You know their tough from history. You know what they have done in the past. The scores they've made. The strong members that they have in the team. This is the same thing I'm using. That Jesus Christ, having conquered, he is a conqueror already. So the moment you join his team, you are already a conqueror. Hallelujah. This is what you have been called to, a life of sacrifice. So, dear friends, 
I want you to know that just like Paul said, let us forget the past and move on. When the choir was singing here, they sang Galatians chapter 5 verse 19. The, the things of the flesh, you see, the things of the flesh, debauchery, sinful, sinful nature, idolatry, witchcraft, sexual immorality, and all those kind of things. If we can forget this, the sinful flesh, the past where we came from, and decide to follow Jesus Christ, he'll get hold of, your, our, of our hands and will walk with us as victors with him. Hallelujah. Now, friends, I'm saying this in conclusion. That may our God help us to listen to the voice of Christ. May our God help us to understand his will for us. May our God help us that we may live as sons and daughters of God who are willing to sacrifice ourselves for him that he may prepare us to live with him forever this is why jesus knew and jesus said jesus knew the troubles that we are going through and he said in the book of uh, in the book of uh, matthew when he said in matthew come to me all of you who are heavy laden that's matthew chapter 11 verse 28 come to me all of you that are heavy laden and i will give you rest Jesus knew that we are troubled individuals. We have troubled families. We have, we have turbulence. We have chaos in our families, in our homes, in our communities, at our schools, and even in the church. He wants you to come to him. He wants you to submit to him that he may give you his power to overcome. He will give you his power to move on. He will give you the power to become a blessing to the community, a blessing first to your family, a blessing to the community, a blessing to, ch to your church, and a blessing to the, uh, to the larger society for the glory of his name. May God help us that as we move along this life, as we continue as his servants, we should know that Christian sacrifice means forgetting the past, leaving the problems that you that you came from, living traditions of your forefathers, and moving along in this new life with Jesus Christ, the conqueror, so that he may, may prepare us for eternal life. That is my prayer with you in Jesus' name. Precious Lord, we thank you for the gift of life. You've allowed each and every one of us to be here to listen to your voice. That as Christians, we should sacrifice. You are the one who sacrificed first when you gave up your own son jesus christ who came to bring us salvation and eternal life therefore we also in your love as your friends help us to sacrifice our past help us to sacrifice those things that we hold so dear yet do not hold to our salvation may your holy spirit use us throughout our lives. Your son has come here. You know the challenges that he's going through. Whatever it is, you understand much better. May you please help him conquer. May you please help him succeed. May you remember our families also in different locations and even those who are represented here. May you remember the Adventist men organization and the members of this church that they may be able to walk as Christians, as blessing to their families and blessing to the neighborhoods and blessing to their community and even blessing to the entire world and above all prepare each and every one of us to live with you for eternity in jesus name we pray amen god bless you